I think we have to educate the governments about Bitcoin. Otherwise, they'll have bad policy come out. They'll try to ban self-custody or things like that. And we just try to tell them it's not possible. You're trying to ban information. It's not possible to stop the flow of information. It's just too porous. And I think um, at a higher level, Bitcoin is going to transform the, relation bet the relationship between the individual and the state. And I think we need to educate the state on what is going to happen. Because the, there's a massive amount of game theory behind Bitcoin, how it will play out, how nations will compete to get hash rate or to get Bitcoin accumulated in their treasuries. But they need to know about the game first in order for the game theory to fully play out. Mark, when it comes to nation state adoption, Holto state adoption, what comes to your mind when you think of Samsung Mao? Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is Samsung Mao and Chen Free, of course. Thank you. And Thank you. I mean, Bitcoin is actually a grassroots movement, but you're doing Bitcoin nation state adoption. So maybe can you just tell us why is nation state adoption important? Because Bitcoin actually is a grassroots movement, but why? do we have to adopt from both levels? So from the nation state side, but also from the grassroots. Yeah, so I think uh, all forms of adoption are important, but somebody has to engage with the government because there are laws and regulations that can prohibit adoption of Bitcoin. Like, yes, you can start a Bitcoin beach community, but if, uh, you know, if it's illegal to pay with Bitcoin, then technically you can be cracked down on. So we hope to work with politicians and regulators to deregulate Bitcoin and help them see Bitcoin as money because that will help those grassroots adoptions initiatives. And I think um, at a higher level, Bitcoin is going to transform the, relation bet the relationship between the individual and the state. And I think we need to educate the state on what is going to happen because the, there's a massive amount of game theory behind Bitcoin, how it will play out, how nations will compete to get hash rate or to get Bitcoin accumulated in their treasuries. But they need to know about the game first in order for the game theory to fully play out, right? They have to know there is a game before they'll accept that the, there's game theory at play. So I think that's really where we come in. We'll just educate them about what Bitcoin is, why it's important, and what is happening at a macro level between other nations. And we just talk with them and be a resource. Yeah. So you, it's exactly like you say, you can't forbid Bitcoin. And if you're not opening from a game theory point, it's pretty stupid because you're losing. Therefore, you have to, yeah, you have to open yourself for, for Bitcoin. So can you maybe um, tell a bit about the process? So what is the process? Are the states coming to you? Are you coming to the state? And there are different types of adoptions. I think there is not like one way of adoption. There are different forms of adoption. Yeah, so a lot of people ask us like, what is the playbook? What is the process? There is no process because every country is different. Every community is different in other places. Like you have the Princess Hotel, Bitcoin Hotel. That's not common, right? It's not like there's no El Salvador equivalent, right? So every place is going to be different and we approach every country different too because it's really about what do they need. For example, when we we're in Costa Rica, we know that the government has a mandate to double their energy production capabilities. And we're trying to frame it as Bitcoin mining can help you get there uh, through partnerships with mining companies or other, other vehicles to bring in capital to build out more hydro capacity. And that is what they're interested in. So you kind of have to get, put it from the angle of what is beneficial to them, not just say you need Bitcoin, because that really is, uh, turns people off. You have to get them on the same wavelength and then on the same connection. But yeah, there is no real same playbook. And we depend a lot on Bitcoiners on the ground in different places to help us and make introductions and make connections. So um, it really depends. Like in Mexico, I had the fortune of meeting Indira Kempis, the senator. So it's you know, the government reaching out. But in other places, it could be just normal Bitcoiners, plebs that say, oh, I know somebody and you should talk to this guy. Um, and where we're going next, which is a top secret for now. Yeah, uh, I know it. <laughs> you know it, but uh, that was done by Prince Philip. So he has his connections and he said, we need to talk about Bitcoin. And then that meeting was set up and now we're flying there to meet with them. Yes. Yes. 
because I think it's a bit similar than like company adoption because I think it's important to showcase that Bitcoin is working and if a state, I mean, you can see it in El Salvador, it has lots of positive effects and this positive effect is like um, uh, like um, throwing in the in the world and if then other com um, yeah, countries can see it's working, then they will come to you and then they, you can advise them and probably everyone will benefit even though some hardcore Mexis will say, okay, no, we just have to do it from the grassroots. But in my opinion, we have to be open for everyone and some people that just are not on the yeah, right place, they don't have the knowledge and then you can help. Yeah, pretty much. Like I think we have to educate the governments about Bitcoin. Otherwise, they'll have bad policy come out. They'll try to ban self-custody or things like that. And we just try to tell them it's not possible. You're trying to ban information. It's not possible to stop the flow of information. It's just too porous. But what you said earlier is really true. Like The countries that adopt Bitcoin, they have this kind of uh, difference about them. They're welcoming to business. They're welcoming to immigration and they're very hospitable. And I, I often give this example, like the, the nation state or the country should actually be more like a hotel, right? Why do you choose a hotel? You choose a hotel that's safe, it's comfortable, and you, you feel good being there. It's the same for a country. As people are being more mobile and they're looking for opportunities to move, they're going to choose the countries that are like hotels, that are safe, that they see have a good future, a good prospect, that they're comfortable in, and there's economic freedom, right? So I think there's a, a direct parallel there to hotel state adoption and nation state adoption, where nation states are going to become more like hotels, right? And I think the incentives will align better because when you want to attract people, like a business, you, will, you need to have good policy and a good framework in place for everything. Yeah, so it's, it's awesome, like this, this comparison between hotel and nation state adoption, that's, um, yeah, pretty fun way to, to see it. So the last question would be, what is the next country to announce legal tender? We'll see. I, I actually think it's going to be a country that doesn't need legal tender. So there's uh, two countries in Latin America, Guatemala and Panama. Panama doesn't have a central bank, so they, can act, they actually can use any currency they choose to. So we just need the next prime president there to say Bitcoin is welcome and you're done. And in Guatemala, they have a law called uh, the currency law, divisas. And it just says you can use any foreign currency as money in Guatemala. So they actually also don't need a legal tender. They just need the regulator or the next president to say, Bitcoin is welcome and you're done. So I think pushing a law forward, like a Bitcoin law, like El Salvador, is actually very difficult. You have to have the right, the perfect mix of political conditions where the president has a supermajority or there's a massive wave of orange pilling and all the politicians know, but that is not very common. So I think the more likely are those two candidates where they don't need any change in law. So this was a great sum up and I would say thanks a lot, Samson. Yeah, thank you're, you, Mark. You're busy, you're going to the next meeting now and yeah. thank you guys, thank you listeners and see you soon. Uh, and and thank the, you for the, the drumming. Quest, the last question, when are you coming to the Bitcoin Hotel? We'll see. <laughs> when, when Germany needs Bitcoin adoption, I'll come. Okay, I will call Olaf and then we will talk to Olaf Scholz and then we call you. Yeah. Yes. But we got to bring the band back together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because and what we did not talk about, Samson's actually not just doing nation state adoption, he's also a rock star. <laughs> no, you too. <laughs> um, he's part of the Nevermind band together with me, Knut and Michael Fischer. But you said you were nervous before the gig and normally when you go to big ventures and, and venues and have talks, you're never nervous. So yeah. how was it to be like behind the band or be part of the band or well, be a Bitcoin rock star? If we had more practice, <laughs> I think uh -huh. it's okay. Uh -huh. Because like you, I haven't played for a long uh -huh. time. Yes. You're 10 years, right? Yes, yes. I'm like 20 something uh -huh. years. Yes. So you yes. know, next time we practice ahead of time. Yeah, but be good. now we practice the next time it's, it's better. <laughs> I did not even have the chance to practice on a, on a drum kit. I just used like um, towels to practice. <laughs> so yeah. But next... you were good. All the comments yeah. were like, yeah. the drummer is great. Yeah. But the thing is, they were so drunk, no one realized. So yeah. yeah. But then also Knut was drunk too. Yes. So yes. It's a mixed bag. Yes, but Knut was really the rock star because we looked like a school band. 
we, but Knut, he was really looking like a rock star. <laughs> well, he is a rock star. <laughs> yes. He, he's a professional rock star. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really looking forward for our next gig. Yeah. And yeah, maybe next conference or yeah. next year. We will see. And maybe. Samson, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mark. See you guys and peace out. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,